Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us for another hour of answering your gardening questions. Spring is really just getting started. Soon it will be time to get your own garden started. So if you've got questions, give us a call 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll free number is 800-676-5446. Emailed questions go to byf at unl.edu for future shows. Please attach those pictures as JPEGs. Do not forget to tell us where you live or I will have to send you an email and ask you that question. We do love hearing from you on Thursday nights. Don't forget to follow us during the week on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So, Wayne, your first show of the season, and you gave us a test as I a panel. I did give you a test, too, <laughs> have refused to answer. Well, what's up with that? <laughs> well, what I brought were two monarch butterflies. And for the audience, I will say you need to figure out whether I'm the type of person that put the male butterfly on the left or on the right. And as you look, they are slightly different in coloration. I will warn you, the duller one is 18 years old and collected by a much younger me without as much experience in preservation. The other one is three years old. That's the brighter one. So, Kim, congratulations. You were Nailed right. Nailed it. <laughs> the one here, if they zoom in, you can see that little dark spot on the hind wing in the middle of the vein on this one. See here. Right there, dot, that little yeah. dot, black dot right there. That swelling says that it's a male. And that's I how just you thought tell. it was prettier, and you know, the male bird is usually prettier. Typically, than the but if you look at the female, there's no swelling on the, that particular vein on the back end. And for those that are excited about monarchs, the first one was sighted in Omaha for Nebraska yesterday. Wow. And if you're wondering where you can follow where they're at on the migration run, you can go to Journey North, it's a website, and they will have the animation on there for not only monarchs, but lots of other things uh, in, in their Journey North. You can follow it as you go. Pretty cool. Thank you, Wayne. Dennis, you look like uh, Game of Thrones is going on in yeah. front of you. <laughs> well, it's a type of time of year that the birds want to put nests around. And we do have three species that are invasive that you can eradicate in any way. That's the house sparrow, English starling, or feral pigeon. But all the others are somewhat protected, and once they form their nest and put young in it or eggs in it, then you have to leave them alone. But the best thing is to stop them from doing that. There's several devices out there that we call porcupine wire. There's a stainless steel one that lasts a long time. There's the plastic one that may only last a couple of years, but is much more inexpensive. And you put this where the birds are starting to build a nest, okay? And they have one as a combination of metal and plastic. And so these can bend over different things, over light fixtures, and you just need it to stay there so the birds cannot build a nest. If they put a hole in the side of your building before you patch it up, because you can get them out by just attacking this around the hole, the bird comes out, but the bird cannot go back in. And then after the bird is gone, it finds a new house, hopefully in a tree, then you can take this away and patch the hole and stop the bird from going in and out of the house. So the birds will actually open that little door? Yeah, they just, going into it's it. really easy to open. Oh, cool. I uh, need one of those on my house. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Dennis. Amy, uh, it's that pepper plant that we had a little email conversation about. We did have some email conversations. So I know a lot of people have started plants, and if you're watching John Porter's um, YouTube videos on tomatoes, we're starting to get some questions about my tomatoes, my peppers don't look right. And this is a sample that was brought in to me. And if we take a closer look at it, we're seeing the, the new leaves that are coming out. And as you can see, we're calling it bootstrapping. You see how it's all crinkled up. And you can kind of look at the leaf that there's a string in the middle of it and you pulled on it like you do on a cinch bag and it all crinkled up. And that's called bootstrapping. And this is typical symptoms that we see with growth regulator herbicide injury. So the question is, why are we seeing it inside? Typically, we're gonna see this later in the year, but depending on where you're at in the state, um, some of our ag chemicals are going out already that have growth regulator chemicals in them, and depending on the weather, they can move. 
uh, depending on wind and different components like that. So if you have your windows open, there's a possibility that some of that herbicide could have drifted in. The other one they can think about is if you have your transplants or your seedlings growing in a uh, your garage. Do you have any growth regulator herbicides that are stored in there? Maybe there's some vapors or fumes coming off of that that could be impacting the plants. The nice thing is if they are growth regulators, the plants grow out of it. You just have to give it a little bit of time. And that's probably the quickest, quickest remedy is, is it a growth regulator herbicide injury or is it virus? If it grows out of it, it's a herbicide. If it's a virus, it never grows out of it. And every leaf coming out from then on, it's gonna look that bootstrapping and all curled and wrinkled. So, but classical growth regulator damage that we're seeing right there. Well, it's kind of good to know, I guess, because we did wonder about that one. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Amy. All right, Jeff, you get beauty instead of tools. Ho hopefully of no bootstrapping on these plants. <laughs> um, we have a couple things here. You know, it's interesting, I was on a couple weeks ago and it was kind of difficult to find some things that were in flower at that point, but here we've had two relatively warm, dry weeks and lots of sunshine, so everything literally is blooming at the same time right now. So tonight on the left here, uh, or your right, is uh, a Judd Viburnum, so it's one of the fragrant kind of early Viburnums. I like to think of it as a pretty early one. And uh, so it's, it's adding some perfume to the landscape right now. And then the one I have on the other side here is pearl bush. And so this is one, you, you know, this particular plant's quite large, but uh, Kim and I were talking, there's some newer selections out there that are smaller, but it's, I think of it as kind of an old fashioned garden shrub. Um, so once it blooms, it just kind of becomes a, a green plant. There's not a lot of fall color with it or anything like that, but it's kind of fun this time of year. And pretty unusual for people yeah. who are looking for something that you can't buy everywhere. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks. That was a great round. So let's go to first pictures for you. And these are directly triggered, unfortunately, Wayne, by the fact that we did cut down a tree in Lincoln and they did confirm emerald ash borer. So you've got one, two, three pictures here yep. that you can talk about what we see. All right, that's a great example of the exit hole that the adult emerald ash borer makes when it leaves the tree. You can see it, it's a classical D shape, so it's got that flat area on top with the rounded area down below. Uh, there are some native borers. Sometimes when they come out at an angle, you get a little bit of a D shape, but this one, you can tell, goes straight in and out. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good uh, indicator that's emerald ash borer. And then here are the serpentine galleries. You notice they wander a lot back and forth as it goes underneath the bark that's been peeled back. Mm -hmm. uh, the other borers tend to more a wandering line, not a zigzag back and forth. Okay. Or they go in and out of the wood, the surface wood there. So that's some of the things you look for. So here's the adult. The adult is about a half inch long, bright metallic green. Uh, the larva has, it's really hard to tell, but right above the head and the middle part of the adult there, there's these bell-shaped sections of the larva. So that's about a full-grown larva right there uh, with what's going on. So those are your indicators. The other things to watch for, if you're concerned about a particular tree, um, are you having woodpeckers visit it more frequently than you think they should? Uh, I was looking at my father-in-law's last summer and he's in an area in Iowa that has mm -hmm. emerald ash borer, but his trees are declining. One was struck by lightning, the other one in the front yard is just declining. It has very large holes. It looks more like carpenter worm. So that, and I look back, we've talked about carpenter worm a little bit on the show this year already. Mm -hmm. and so those are some things you gotta kinda watch for. Size of the holes is important. And most importantly, if you think you have emerald ash borer, please, 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 don't go telling everybody. We don't need to start a panic. You need to contact uh, your local forester or an extension office so that we can get this through the proper channels and you'll be asked not to tell anyone until it has been confirmed through USDA APHIS. That's the final step to an official declaration. Then you're allowed to tell people that, hey, it was my yard. <laughs> all right, thanks Wayne, it's unfortunate, but we knew it was coming, so. All right, Dennis, um, yep. one of Terry's favorite creatures, which is, ah. uh, a snake, yeah. and, and he, he's, he just really wants to know yeah. what it is, and you can tell us a little bit about okay, it. Okay, it's Decay's brown snake, Steria decayi. That's full grown, it looks like a full grown female. They don't get bigger than 10 inches long. They're live birth, they mm. don't lay eggs, 
and they love slugs, and that small little head they put in land snails and suck out the little uh, escargot. Um, so you want these in your landscape. All they eat is slugs and land snails that get into your hostas. So uh, enjoy them. Bring them on in. They're he, great to have. And he thought it was a bull snake. No, no. Yeah, not even close. No, ain't close. Okay. All right. Uh, Amy, this is uh, another indoor plant. This is actually a Syracuse viewer. She started Celebrity Tomatoes Indoors. She wonders why the leaves are curling. She's starting to see it on other tomatoes, and I know it's a little hard to tell whether this is uh, pathological or insectological, but what, what are you gonna say here? So one of the biggest things we're gonna look at is making sure the tomatoes are staying at a fairly adequate temperature. We're not dropping down too cold. So sometimes if we get too cold, we might see some curling going on there. Um, we could be looking at some growth regulator. The trick is if it's cold or growth regulator, it's gonna grow out of it. But if you're seeing it moving to the others, of course we wanna rule out the, the entomological side if there's any bugs, but really what you wanna do is you wanna flip those leaves over and look on the underside or where they're curled in, because they like to curl in and then the bugs like to hide inside there. So you're gonna be looking for tiny little thrips, um, aphids, anything like that that could be crawling around in air, they're gonna be very small. You might see some webbing. They'll do the exact same thing, especially on in our indoor plants this time of year, just because the inside of our houses are dry. Um, and that's when those insects really start to thrive to a certain extent. And we, we're getting to the point we wanna kick everything outside anyway. Um, and if that's the case, then you wanna treat for those insects as best as you can. And I bet Wayne could probably tell us exactly what insecticides we wanna do for those. For those smaller things, like the aphids, thrips, we can use like an insecticidal soap. And the, those are much easier to use inside. We don't have to worry about exposing fish and pets and other things to them. So those are a good way to go. Also, if those seedlings are fairly sturdy, a good shot of water right. in the shower or you know the sprayer at the sink can help really clear those off. All right, thanks. Okay, so Jeff. This is a Bellevue viewer who uh, planted grape hyacinths in their planter, okay. and they've escaped. Sure. And he doesn't want them in the turf. He okay. wants them in the planter. Okay. Any thoughts on that one? Well, I think that's, it's, um, it's kind of an ongoing battle. They're, they're gonna wanna spread. They produce a lot of seed. Uh, they're doing what, they, what they're supposed to do. So they're flowering a lot. They're gonna produce a lot of seed. They're gonna, seed's gonna drop down. and. Um, you're probably going to get pretty good germination. So, you know, right now, other than using some sort of non-selective herbicide, which would end up killing uh, your entire lawn, I would just suggest mowing them off. And if you don't want it to spread anymore, especially this year, look at uh, taking those uh, flowers off those in the bed before or right at the end of the bloom so that they're not producing any seed. Clean that up really well. And then let, next year, I would look at doing some pre-emerge in that area to help uh, reduce that as well. So maybe an early pre-emerge, sometime maybe at the end of March, so that we get some of that early. All right, thank you, Jeff. Well, you know, we did have a tough, but maybe normal winter this year in Nebraska, especially in the months of February into March. Even some of our native and hardy plants had some issues once the warm weather kicks in, and sometimes those furry friends can cause serious issues. Let's take a few minutes to look at some winter damaged plants and see if there's anything we can do to help those plants this spring. Now that spring has finally started to arrive in Nebraska, we're getting an awful lot of questions about winter damage in the landscape, really independent of the flood damage. I wanna start by talking about shrubs and trees, especially the deciduous ones, and what you really should look for. Start by snapping a twig on anything that really appears as though it is not breaking dormancy yet. If that twig snaps, that's a former twig. But then the next thing you need to do is do the scratch test, go down a little further on those, on those canes or on those branches, and see whether you're actually seeing anything green under that outside bark. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get great leaves, great foliage, great flowers, because you could still have an awful lot of that plant die because of the winter. However, at least you do know that there is one point where the plant is still alive. We have a lot of examples. Rose of Sharon really did a lot of dieback this year. Things like Wygelia, the button bushes, 
We have New Jersey tea that we're looking at as almost a perennial. So many of the plants that are showing this dieback, or at least the tip dieback, are ones that may or may not be fully hardy here to begin with. You might also see a fair amount of damage in some of the perennials and grasses in your landscape this year, especially the ones that might have been marginally hardy or were planted in the fall and really didn't get a chance to establish. The grasses in particular can show a very large dead center with only a small amount of green on the outer edges. Chrysanthemums are another example. Lavender, which really is a subshrub, might just have a little bit of foliage at the base. Again, you want to wait to make sure that you are not completely giving up on those plants until you do see some growth on the stems. Another issue with a lot of our perennials is critter damage, and this was a really good year for critter damage. You can see some trails through some of them. You can see where the centers really look like they've died out, but if you get down on in, into those centers with your hands, you might be able to actually pull the crown up and that is going to indicate that you had voles or gophers or mice or rabbits doing a fair amount of damage. On our woody plants, trees and shrubs, rabbits did a great deal of harm this year. And that was true in places where we had a lot of snow cover. We're seeing damage in rows of Sharon, in Euonymus, a lot of roses, many, many plants in the rose family where the damage is not down at the base, which would have been typical for rabbits or voles, it's up high because, of course, they stood on those snow banks. And we're even seeing full stripping of the branches on trees. And of course, if there's not bark left, you really don't have much left to work with. Winter injury can show up in evergreens on the west or southwest side, on the side that is more exposed to the wind or against the sidewalk, or in those places where we had a lot of salt or de-icer use. If you see brown tips, brown branches, no needles, that is a former branch on evergreens. They will not refoliate. You're not going to get new needles. But again, as with all landscape plants, as we go into the spring, you want to really make sure that you know that death has occurred before you do any major pruning, where, whether it is on the trees, the shrubs, the evergreens, or even the perennials to set them and get them started for the rest of the year. Sometimes it's hard really to accept that dead is dead, but for a majority of these plants, time and patience might tell if, they'll take, if they made it through the winter. Do your best to keep your hands off for now, continue to check those plants for damage, and then when you're finally sure it's dead, then you get to go shopping. Yeah. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Wayne, this is, uh, this is a viewer who lives in Bellevue and found these along the Missouri River. He also saw digging in the garden, he found some green worms along with the garden variety night crawlers, and he wondered if he's discovered some new, new alien creature species of worm. Well, the green ones, there's a number of caterpillars we can find in the ground that overwinter as caterpillars. Uh, there's some cutworms that do that as well. Uh, so there, there's that. This particular picture, I had a tough time quite telling, you, know, you can see that your standard worm there and then right about that lighter colored one. I looked really, really hard to see if I could find some legs on the end of it and I, I couldn't quite find anything. So I'm not entirely sure what that particular one is. And without it being stretched out and a really good shot to know what end is the head end or the back end, I can't really tell you about that. Dennis, you're looking at it like you're looking looking really maybe hard. it's a snake. No, it's not a snake. Yeah. It, it's, it's an annelid for sure. but. I don't know if it, maybe it drowned in all the yeah. colors out of it, yeah. or it was in the process of drowning, the color got out of it. I, don't, I would have to see it up close. And all right, so if he finds another one, maybe he could bring it. Yeah, to one of you. bring it to us. Okay, all right. Take it up to Norfolk. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so uh, Dennis, you have um, some pictures that are okay. associated with that damage yeah. and so eating shrubs, euonymus, all sorts of things. Some of the branches are shredded, they've yeah. got holes. Um, it's voles. So, okay. Voles are this one. There was, there was on this one. Yeah, yeah. there's a de typical yeah. vole. Yeah. Um, it probably was snow cover when they did that damage mm -hmm. and the thicker the snow cover, the more damage they can do because it's insulated, it's warm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be negative 20 above, but the snow cover, it's only 32 down there. Mm -hmm. So they love to do that. When we have a heavy snow cover, you get a lot more vole damage. Okay, and just... Voles, yeah. 
Yeah. You can use a multi-catch trap. Um, multi-catch traps are sold in most garden centers. Uh, you don't need to hardly bait them and just put them around the runs and they go in there and flip over. And just to back up about the bird exclusion, just get on Google and put uh, bird exclusion devices and a home area will come up that you can order online. All right, thanks Dennis. Okay, so this is, we actually had one of these last week, but it was a very unusual one, Amy. Okay. And this, this, is a, uh, this is a viewer who says he's seen fairy rings elsewhere, everywhere. This year he has one, and he has neighbors that have them. And he says their, lar their lawn is long. He does want to know, is there a fungicide he can use, or what do we recommend for fairy rings? <sighs> fairy ring is one of those that's really difficult to manage in all reality. So you see that bright green right there? That is the fungus actively breaking down your dead, dead organic matter. So one of the biggest things you need to do is you need to see how thick that thatch is. And we don't want our thatch getting two, three inches thick. We want it at an inch and a half. And so if your thatch is really thick, we're gonna be looking at aerating or power raking and trying to get that dead material up out of there. And the reason why it's green is that's being converted into nitrogen and so all of a sudden this grass has a, has a little boost of nitrogen and energy and now it's bright green. So aeration is one big key with it. There are varieties that are a little more resistant, um, tolerant to fairy ring but your biggest thing is going to be aeration. And if you really don't like the color fertilization, but then we have to be careful if we don't add too much nitrogen because then we're setting ourselves up for future disease issues such as brown patch later in the summer, which likes very lush, green, actively growing turf. So it, you're, you're doing a balance game between the two of them. So definitely look at that thatch and aerate or power rake that lawn if need be. All right, thanks Amy. All right, Jeff, you have two different viewers with two different sets of tree questions, okay. and in all cases, these are autumn blaze maples. Okay. So this first one is obviously, it's a, a, a double. Uh, she thinks it's too late to remedy that, but there's also a smaller branch, so she's thinking she can cut the little one out, save the big ones. Yeah, I don't disagree. I mean, you yeah. could do that. Um, you know, I guess what I would say is as this tree ages, you have an increased chance of a major failure right. um, with that, with a snow load or a heavy wind. Right. So I, I guess I would consider at this point maybe um, going with something else in that place yeah. and just taking the tree out and just doing it now instead of waiting. Okay, and then so. I think your, your next picture is actually a little bit older one where that the crack extends all the way down the trunk on this one. Yeah, and again, it's kind of that included bark and, right. and it's pulling apart. So, you know, it doesn't look like it's obviously failed yet, but I would say this is what you'd want to keep an eye on. Certainly wouldn't want to park your Lamborghini underneath it uh, <laughs> or anything like that. And, um, you know, and kind of prepare yourself for a new plant in that place or, you know, it's an opportunity again to, to uh, rethink how your yard is landscaped and maybe do some, make some changes. All right, thanks, Jeff. You know, we've really enjoyed the splash of color our tulips have given us out at our backyard farmer garden. As they start to fade and the weather warms up, it'll soon be time to plant. Here's Terry James to tell us what's going on in the backyard farmer garden. This week at the backyard farmer garden, we're slowly seeing those spring flowers fade away our red and white tulips are almost completely gone and we are really looking forward to beginning our major work outside. As you remember, we have lots of plants indoors. Probably within the next week or so, we're gonna start moving those outside of the greenhouse, hardening them off. We actually have gotten some of our early seed, radishes, lettuces, uh, cabbages, those kinds of things seeded in our raised beds. So we're gonna, keep those watered if we don't get any rain here over the weekend and make sure that those are coming up nicely. And we're just gonna keep on top of all of our weeds and we're going to make sure that all of our beds are ready for that time to start planting our garden. Stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this week and see what's happening in the garden. 
Hopefully that weather will hold. We will get all of those plants planted in the next few weeks. And of course, we're always excited to get going for another great season. And we love those visitors. It's lots and lots of fun. All right, not so much fun. Wayne, this is an Omaha viewer who says they have stink bugs inside, outside. How to get rid of them started last year. Oh, this sounds like brown marmorated stink bugs exactly. to me. Exactly, which in, I think if John, they're inside. we had already, yeah. Well, the best thing you can do to keep them from inside your house is make sure all your weather stripping is in good working order. You have all the gaps and cracks and everything filled around exhaust pipes, um, furnace vents, dryer vents, anything like that. Uh, one thing I have found is you need to make sure you check around where your electrical comes in because if you had a, had a new meter or a new panel put in or a new feed, oftentimes it's forgotten to seal around that conduiting that's coming in and you can end up with a nice quarter inch gap between the conduiting and the side of the house. Great avenue for a lot of things to get in. Uh, so seal things up, put screens over, slat vents, make sure any of your turtle vents in the roof or peak vents have good screening on it that's smaller. You can't get away with quarter inch. You gotta go with small metal window screening in order to keep a lot of the insects out. All right, thanks, Wayne. So Dennis, you know, mm -hmm. we talked about wascally wabbit damage. Yes. And seeing a lot of it up high this year, why? Because our snow is that high. And rabbits are, have big, they have snowshoes on. <laughs> so just climbed up on the snow. Yeah, they just, some, yeah. they just climb right up and then they reach up. And so you can tell in areas where the snow drifted, the damage is even higher. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just where they can get to it. And so the more snow we have, the higher they can go. All right, all the way to the roof. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, this is an indoor plant question from uh, a Hornick, Iowa viewer. Mm -hmm. She has peace lily and it's showing um, brown and yellow tips on the ends of the leaves. She does say that she lets it dry down to wilt before she waters. So you could be potentially looking at two things. One, you're not watering enough. Um, peace lilies don't like to get their feet dry. They like to stay wet. And the other one would be depending on if you're on city water. Um, I have seen situations where we've run into a little bit of salt accumulation. Um, so with that, with those salt accumulations, you stick it underneath the, the uh, faucet in the kitchen and you run water through it. And you really try to push those salts out of that soil mixture and it has a tendency to help it out. And if it's a little dry, that extra water doesn't hurt it. So try watering it a little bit more. All right, thanks. Jeff, this is a Bellevue viewer who had a walnut tree taken down. Yeah. And, and they're wondering how long the jug loan stays in the soil after the tree was removed from the root system. Boy, that's a tough question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say, I would wanna see a significant uh, decay of that stump. Um, I think by that time, if that stump is, if you didn't have the stump ground, if there's still a stump there, um, I would I would look for that, and, and you know those stumps can be persistent for some time. It may take you know five years for it really to decay. So you'll start seeing some of the uh, mushrooms growing on some of the old roots, maybe, and that'll be your indication that it's broken down enough. So all right, keep those tomatoes out of that. Spot. I would I would keep them out of there. All right, thanks. Are you ready, Jeff? Yes, ma'am. We have a viewer who wants to know: Is it too late to apply a pre-emergent with isoxybin in it? No, I wouldn't think it'd be too late. I'd, I know things are warming up and things are starting to germinate, but I'd go ahead and make your application right away. All right, we have a viewer who says that they have good luck uh, pouring boiling water on their weeds in their sidewalk. What do you think? Boiling water, it, does, it sounds organic to me, so I go for it. All right, uh, this is a Saunders County viewer who actually put three to four feet of sand around cottonwood to make a beach. Do we expect that cottonwood to survive? Um, it might, how, how does it say how old the cottonwood is, mm -hmm. does it? So I would th say if it's a larger cottonwood, it may be able to tolerate that. A younger tree may have a tough time surviving that. All right, uh, will lemongrass come back if you protect it over the winter? I think sometimes it does. I've had it return some years, but I, I know it's gone now from our garden. All right, we have year old herbicide, a glyphosate base. Mm -hmm. How do we dispose of that or should we? Well, I think most counties offer uh, a chemical take or give back program, so I think that's what I would look for. I know Lancaster County does that, so. All right, nice job. Are you ready, Amy? Yes. Okay. 
So we have a viewer who has started plants in their home. The plants damped off, but they want to put the soil into their compost bin. Good idea or bad idea? It's a good idea if you know your compost bin is going up to the right temperature. If your compost is a little cool, I would not do it because you're setting yourself up for future diseases. All right, this is a Columbus viewer who said they had a problem with artillery fungus one year on their siding on their house. Should they expect that again or is it a flash in the pan? You could see it again. It's the coolest fungi in the world though to see it attack. Um, <laughs> it's in your mulch, so if you put new mulch in it should help. All right. Um, is it time to spray the pines for tip blight? Yes, we're starting to see those candles starting to enlarge. So yes, spray. All right, we have a viewer who missed the pink bud stage for treating apple trees. Is it too late to do anything at all? Um, I would still go ahead and do it. We, you'll still get a little bit of protection at this point in time. All right, uh, anthracnose in trees, is that under wet or dry conditions? Wet weather. Um, it's been a little, well, I guess it depends on where you're at in the state. Where I'm at in north central Nebraska, it's been a little cool for anthracnose, um, but definitely if you're in the southeast part, part of the state, you could start seeing a little bit of it, but it likes wet, but you got also drier in the southeast right now too, so. All right, thank you much. Dennis, you ready? Bring it on. <laughs> we have a viewer who says the bottom branches of his lilacs are being strewn about the yard by something, what? It's probably a larger bird picking up the small branches to or a squirrel to make a nest. All right, are, are foxes migratory or once they find a nice den spot, do they stay? They stay. Uh, males may move, young males may move to new territories, but they pretty much keep their population in the same spot year after year after year. All right. Uh, we have an Omaha viewer who thinks that moles ate the roots of their hostas. Would that be what they would have eaten? No. They eat no moles eat no vegetation. They are insectivores and eat earthworms primarily. So it, probably, it could have been voles. All right. What would make a two to four inch diameter hole with soil around, uh, under the roots of an old stump? This is also in Omaha. Two to four inches? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good size. It could be a rabbit making a form to have babies. Okay. How, uh, how can you keep squirrels from digging up all the plants in your flower pots? Put chicken wire over it. All right. Do those spray repellents ever actually really work? No. Nice job. Okay. Guess I know what I need to do. Yep. Seven or better. No, no, brother, I'm glad I, I'm glad I made up seven questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this could be interesting. So we have a viewer who wants to know, is there any way that you can spray roses to prevent rose sawflies? You can. Uh, you'd have to make sure to spray the undersides of the leaves, but it's best to wait till you start seeing the damage and use the hose. Okay. We had a, uh, several viewers last year that had carpenter bees. When do you start to watch for their damage? It would be, usually it's summertime, June-ish, uh, and they do not like to go through painted or treated wood, so get, get it covered. Okay, so are ticks going to be worse than usual or less worse in the flooded areas this year? We'll have to wait and see. Okay. Um, when does grub control go down for Japanese beetles? See here, it's the same time as your annual and three year white grub control. So if you're doing preventative, June. All right. Uh, Zimmerman pine moth is an issue in especially the eastern part of the state. When do we treat for that? We treat before they get into the tree. Mm. So you have to get them before egg hatch, so before they bore in. All right, so also the same viewer who wondered about uh, pink bud for path is wondering about pink bud for insects, too late in apples? Well, if they're starting to break in flower, you do not want to spray because you're going to hurt your pollinators, then you're not going to get apples. All right, awesome. Dennis wins this one because he knew for the tiebreaker. You can't take it home. I'm not going to take it home. You can just look at it and know that you won. <laughs> and you'll probably never win again. So okay. just <laughs> Oh, it's rigged. Zero. Okay, now you've had it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you get the you get the next picture question. <laughs>
Oh, plan of the week. Plan of the week. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Plan okay. of the week. It's all right. You Go. were having fun down there while we were sitting down here. <laughs> they're depressed that we've lost again. So. All right. Jeff, what are the plans of the week? Well, Kim, you brought us to uh, nice, I think of, of, to me, these are like forest early spring perennials. Mm -hmm. So the nice pink one here is the, the classic bleeding heart, Dicentra. And, uh, and you were telling me before the show that this particular one is, is seeding around your yard, which mm -hmm. is kind of a nice gift to have. Mm -hmm. And then the taller variegated one is a true Solomon seal, a variegated Solomon seal. And that's another one that will spread itself and form little colonies, so which mm -hmm. can be nice if it's in the right place. Exactly, and, and it really is a nice forest combination. Yeah, yeah. Shade, part shade. Yeah. There you go. All right, now, picture questions. Are so, you sure? The little voice in my ear is saying it's picture questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a uh, this is south of Hickman, and she says her burning bush had aphids or spider mites. She's used insecticidal soap. Now it's barely leafed out. The leaves are curling. She's wondering, it's if, is it the same thing or is this? Does it specify whether she sprayed this year already? Uh, it does not. Okay. Well, when we look at this, the first thing that comes to mind is it's way too early for mites, spider mm -hmm. mites especially. We think of hot, dry weather, uh, which is more conducive to spider mites. It could be early aphids, but you should be able to find them in those curled up leaves if that's what's there. When I look at this, it looks like classic herbicide, like what Amy talked about mm -hmm. with that poor pepper plant. Mm -hmm. That's what I think of when I see this. And the confounding factor is the one right next to it that it intermingles branches with does not have it. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're gonna have to get out there and inspect really closely to see if those aphids are there. Then you can use that insecticidal soap again. Uh, make sure if you are using that to swap out what the active ingredient is so you're not using the exact same thing time after time. All right, and also give it a little bit of time and just see what is going on with that plant, right? Well, let's, let's get into your inspection. Make sure, right. see if there is anything there, and then, Go and then it's it. a waiting game. Okay. It's not. All right, you have a couple of pictures on this okay. one. So the first is a tulip bulb, and, and he's wondering what would, he's, he's not seeing trails or anything. He wonders if it's a pocket gopher, or what exactly is chewing on his tulips yeah. here? It's likely to be a vole, mm -hmm. because a gopher would probably take most of that in a couple bites. The vole will nibble on it and go on. And it's hard to see trails this time of year because a lot of rain and plants are starting to grow to cover their trails. All right, and your second one is actually a, a root ball of, of a shrub yeah. chewed. And I tried to enlarge this and it got kind of pixel, but the one to the, looking at the picture on the right side of the picture, that almost looks like a pocket gopher, but then the other looks more like mechanical damage and I couldn't see any teeth marks. Mm -hmm. So this one I would go more with probably a pocket gopher, especially if that area was underground or under mulch. All right, thanks Dennis. Darn critters anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Amy, this is a uh, triboji viewer, which we always appreciate our Iowans. And uh, unfortunately it's a maple tree that looks like that all the way up, uh, 44 years old. He wonders, is this fungi or something else? And he is afraid of the prognosis. Okay, I, I was actually very impressed with the number of shelf or bracket fungi that is being produced on this tree. So whenever we start getting those bracket fungi on there, it is an indication that we have a heart rot in that tree. Mm -hmm. And that is the tr that's the fungus getting out to sporulate. And if we have a heart rot that is not good, that's an indication that the very interior of that tree is rotted and decay, which makes it very vulnerable for high winds, ice, breakage in general. And with it going so far up, I would say it's that entire tree. Mm -hmm. Highly advise that you remove the tree. Mm -hmm. um, and bef I would probably advise sooner, better than later, before we get into the really strong summer storm season especially if there's any possibility that it can land on a building, a car, anything like that, you're just better off removing the tree as a whole. Right. And then replace. Exactly. All right, thanks, Amy. 
This is a winter damage from uh, Omaha, actually, and it's the south side of the house. He did have a lot of snow in front of these ewes, and some were kind of right on top. He wonders if they will grow out of this, Jeff, or w should he trim the damage back, and if so, when? Yeah, uh, this is kind of classic uh, winter damage here, especially if it's on the south side of the house. Mm -hmm. So between warming and cooling at night and, and that sort of thing and dry winds, um, you know, at this stage, it's still a little early. I would suspect that you're going to have to make a decision whether or not you keep these used or not. Um, but I, I would be tempted to wait just to see um, how they come out of this here in the next 30 days. Mm -hmm. And I think that'd be a pretty good indication if you're starting to see a lot of greening up. You know, the reality is it's gonna be a long-term thing. It may take three, five years for it really to return to the way it was. So, you know, I, again, it'll probably have to be a decision you make at some point here in the next 30 days. All right, thank you, Jeff. You know, I'm pretty sure that for the history of the Backyard Farmer Show, an awful lot of people have called in asking how to get rid of the dandelions in their yard. It's true they're a weed and they can take over that turf if they're not managed correctly, but here's Douglas Sarpy County Assistant Educator Scott Evans to tell us why you might want to keep a few of those around. If you've been on social media this winter, there's a good chance that you've ran across some posts about the benefits of dandelion and clover being in your lawn. Now, we, when we think about dandelions, we think of them as a weed because they're such a successful plant. In fact, they're probably one of the most well-recognized weeds out there in the landscape. But we don't take a minute to actually appreciate what the dandelion can provide for our early emerging insects. Dandelions provide about 3.5 to 7 micromoles of nectar. Now to us, that doesn't seem like a lot, but if you're an early bee coming out like a bumblebee or a mason bee, that's going to give you quite the boost that you're looking for. In contrast to other flowering plants at the time, dandelions provide nectar up to 50% sugar, which is that much needed energy that they're going to be looking for. However, when you start looking at the pollen in the dandelions don't provide the protein that the bees actually need. And that's where the um, white clover comes into play. White clover doesn't produce a lot of nectar by nature. However, the protein content of the pollen is substantially higher than the dandelions. In contrast, it provides about 25% crude protein and all of the essential amino acids that the insects are gonna need. So when we're thinking about our landscape, you can decide what you can do if you want to keep some of those plants and to provide the energy for our early emerging pollinators, or you can dig them out. Both dandelions and clover are perennial weeds, so if you're going to try to do any type of management, that should be done in the fall. You get to decide on how many dandelions or clover you want to keep in your, in your landscape. I know that dandelion clovers are weeds of the landscape and you might not be too keen about keeping them there. So if you still want to be a part of the pollinator solution, we have the Nebraska Pollinator Habitat Certification. You can go to our website and check out all the plants that are available for early spring flowering plants. You're going to find a wide array of assortments that you can incorporate into your landscape. And why stop there? You can actually move into choosing plants that are going to help benefit pollinators throughout the entire growing season. So you can check out our website and download the application and you're going to find all the plants there listed. And if you have any questions, you can always contact us here at Nebraska Extension and we can help you with plant selection choices and just general care. So if you want to help the bees this spring, so consider keeping some of those dandelions and clover in your landscape or consider choosing some of the plants that we have picked out for you to help benefit the pollinators. Helping our pollinators out early in the spring will help them do their job later in the season. And that pollinator program offered by Extension really will help you understand what they need. It's worth checking into. And of course, we have lots of pollinator stuff in our garden on campus as well. All right, picture questions. This is, uh, this is actually a Lincoln picture. And this about two inch 
Beetle yep. was found smashed in a parking lot, and, and they just kind of want to know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of unfortunate because it's really a pretty thing. Well, the first thing I'll ask was if the parking lot flooded at some point. <laughs> because this is actually a water scavenger beetle. Really? Uh, the, these large ones, uh, along with a lot of other ones, I see a lot of movement this time of year where mm -hmm. they're moving from one place to another. Mm -hmm. and they scavenge down in the water. They a lot of dead things, and they're not, they're good guys. They're help recycle things that have died off. Hmm. All right. Just happened, this looks like this one met with a car. Yeah. <laughs> In a parking lot. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, the question Gen was, was it dark alley? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dennis, this is a, a Bennington v uh, viewer and has some chew. Yep. First are, uh, I think, some roses and, and, and the, uh, you know, he had miniature lilacs and all sorts of things that were chewed. He's wondering what did the damage on these. It's a cottontail rabbit. You can tell by the incisors and the fact that it's peg incisors behind the normal incisors, leaving that scratch mark. So it's rabbits, okay. cottontail rabbits. And, and then the second is actually Rose of Sharon, and, and, she, and he thought squirrels or rabbits had done all of that damage to about 15 inches up. You think so? That's rabbits, and I, if, I, if you ask them how high the snow was, it, was, so it drifted that. up at that point, and so... Yeah. They took the higher part, and then as the snow went down, they took the lower part. So that is a nice pruning opportunity. Yes, Jeff? Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Maybe at the ground. Don't time, to take it back. time to take it back this year. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Amy, this is a, um, a viewer that found these growths in a tree in their yard in Papillion, and he, he, they think it's a gall, mm -hmm. and they want to know what to do about it. Any thoughts? So I actually have one with me. This is black knot. Um, it is a common fungus that we see on prunus species. So cherry, plum, any of those types of, of species. And so this black blob here is what produces the spores and it goes from tree to tree to tree. Now there isn't a lot we can do. The biggest thing we're gonna recommend is that you prune it out. You wanna get it out of your trees as best as possible. There isn't a fungicide recommendation because it produces spores all summer long. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly having to spray. So um, prune it out. There are resistant cultivars out there, especially if you wanted plums and cherries. Uh, the big kicker for, depending on where you're at, if you're in a rural area, all of our wild plum thickets are just loaded with it, so there's constantly inoculum around. So if you're not specific on an heirloom variety, a plum or cherry, definitely go with the new varieties that are resistant. It's much easier to handle. All right, thank you, Amy. All right, Jeff, we've actually had a couple of people ask questions about rhubarb, you know, sure. being, you know, the stems are limp, but then we have ones that are also... Starting to bolt. Starting early. to bolt already, so is this... Are we seeing this? Is there anything they can do about it? What do we do here? You know, rhubarb is, um, can be a little unpredictable with its flowering. And uh, some of the older varieties have a tendency to want to bolt sooner than some of the newer varieties. Um, especially if it's an old plant, it may, you know, dividing the plants um, may help uh, limit that a little bit. But you know, at this stage, I don't know if I'd be concerned about it. Um, just go in and with a sharp knife, take that stalk off as close as you can. Get it early. You don't want it to, the plant to waste any more energy than it has to on that flower. And, and you may have to do it. It may do it two or three times during the summer. And you know, just keep an eye on it when you go out and, and pull a couple stalks off and make sure you have your knife so you can take that off. All right, excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Well, we have some announcements, of course, of things in the gardening world, and I think our first one up tonight is one that is the May Museum 20th Annual Perennial Plant Sale, Saturday the 4th in Fremont. Our second one is the Nebraska Daylily Society. This is a new one. Bearroot Daylily Sale at Lauritsen Gardens in Omaha on Saturday, May 11th. And we have another one, and that, of course, would be us, Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. So uh, you can watch that on Facebook. And really, the big deal on that one is we know you can't get enough of your favorite gardening <laughs> show, so we've decided to give you some in-depth content. On the 5th, we're 
premiering Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can be watching this programming on Backyard Farmer or the NET Facebook page on 6.30 p.m. Central, again on Sunday, May 5th. For our first program, we're going to be featuring a discussion on flood recovery with Nebraska Extension educators John Wilson and Kathleen Q. And that's Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer, Sunday, May 5th at 6.30 p.m. Central on the Backyard Farmer or NET Facebook pages. So that's using social media to be able to, to do that. So Kim, I have one more announcement. Yes. So if you don't mind, tomorrow, Yes. At 1030 up in Omaha at Lawrence and Gardens, uh, Kim, our own Kim Todd, is going to be presented the Arbor Vitae Award, honoring her true. for her wonderful career here in Nebraska and all the good work she does. And there's going to be an Arbor Day planting as well. Mm -hmm. Are they making you plant the tree? Is that part of the deal? I don't know that. Okay. Yeah. Well, you could. <laughs> so she could plant the tree as well. So anyway, well, so that's very, we're very proud of you. That's exciting. Thank you very much. And that was unexpected. <laughs> I'll get you guys. <laughs> All right, so we, we do have time for questions, however, and this is a Lincoln question, which is red spider mites on the windowsill uh, entering through the window. Is it temporary or will they keep on coming in? Or are they spider mites or clover mites? I, they're mm. probably the clover mites. Okay. As when they, if they're purple, they leave a lovely stain when you smash them. It is extremely difficult to clean up. And if you want to get rid of them, you have to get rid of the clover in your yard, mm -hmm. or basically any legume. Mm -hmm. So if you fight black medic, white clover, red clover, or any of those in your yard, you got to get rid of that mm -hmm. to get rid of the mites. Okay, so it's clover for the pollinators, clover for the clover mites. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you ought to choose some other early season bloomers. There you go. <laughs> instead of the clover. All right, uh, Dennis, this yeah. is a interesting always kind of this time of year we have people whose lawns are like getting sort of nosed up in big old clumps is there a way to tell if that's a skunk or a well, something else yeah. it's usually not a skunk or a raccoon or even an opossum this time of year because there's no grubs for them to go after um, even though sometimes they might go after earthworms but you do have things going after earthworms such as robins which kind of make a small hole, and you will get squirrels uh, trying to find those last nuts that they buried a mm -hmm. couple years ago. So you, you get a lot of small depressions from squirrels as well. But usually it's, it's June or after when you get the skunks and raccoons uh, causing the big problems. All right. In any case, it's lawn damage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it Doesn't is. Bother me. <laughs> All right, so this is a question actually from North Platte, Amy, okay. a follow up for Fairy Ring, which, and it's on former farm ground. Why are they always perfectly round? Because the fairies will only dance in circles. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Now, actually, there's a true reason. So you think about. The fungus started in the middle and then it grows out. And so as a fungus grows out from a central point, it always will make a circle because it's always going to grow evenly out from a center point. And so that's the reason why it's always a circle is because it's growing from a center point and working its way out. It's mm -hmm. a radial. We, we do like the fairies dancing in a circle. <laughs> I better. like that one the best. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff, uh, this is actually a houseplant question and it's shamrock. Okay. Any idea on how to care for one a little longer term than St. Patrick's Day? Well, uh, the, the trick I find with mine is not allowing it to get too wet. Um, make sure that you, you don't have it in too part of a window, but uh, it doesn't tolerate really wet feet. So, you know, let it dry out in between waterings um, and that, that may help, but it seems like a lot of times they just kind of, they kind of drown them, so. Well, and they also, they, they're in bloom for that short period and then they just kind of... Yeah, they do. You're, you're right. It does, yeah. it does cycle, so be patient with it. All right. Thank you, Jeff. This is a table rock question, and it's about a wasp nest, and apparently it's a wasp nest under their deck, three inches long, six to eight inches wide. What is the best time and method to get rid of the wasp nest? That's probably last year's paper wasp nest. So you can get rid of it any time. Unfortunately, I've started already seeing some of the new emergents flying. Wow. And That's you want to get rid of it before that because then you can lower the population around your immediate vicinity. So we're a little late to completely 
get out on it, but you can get it out now because there won't be anything trying to defend it. They always build new nests each they year. Always build new. Okay, I think that's really the big question mm -hmm. is will they go mm -hmm. back in and no. start back over again? Now, if you remove it, they may build another one in the same spot. Okay, good, good to know, I guess. <laughs>